Here's a stunning fact to ponder. In virtually every country in the world, from the U.S. to China, Spain to Dubai, and Nigeria to Norway, classrooms everywhere have two things in common. Number one, they look a lot like they did 100 years ago, and number two, they look about the same as each other. Here's what a classroom looks like 100 years ago. Here's what one looks like today. But even more astounding, if you Google the word classroom, followed by any random list of countries, this is what you'll find. This is what a classroom looks like in the US, and in Taiwan, and in Japan, Uganda, Afghanistan, Tibet, Egypt, the Middle East, China, India, the Himalayan mountain, Vietnam, Peru, in corporate training, in higher education, in rich countries, in developing countries, in the military, and in prison. Why is it that countries that differ so much in language, race, religion, politics, history, size, and geography have classrooms that look the same? And what's up with the fact that they look like classrooms of 100 years ago, when virtually every area of human existence has changed? You know what we're doing? We're lining up students like widgets in a factory and attempting to pour knowledge into their heads. That's astounding. We are well into the 21st century, and schools everywhere are reforming their education. But the one thing that could change everything remains unchanged. And that's how we teach, illustrated by these images. Let's face it, the world has changed. Hey Siri, hey Alexa, and we teachers, I'm a teacher, if we could be replaced by a YouTube video, we should be. I'm not, I'm not bashing teachers, I'm a teacher. What, what I'm saying is we need to rethink what it means to, to be a teacher. That's, like the, that's why the one thing that we need to change how we teach. We need to change how we teach. And specifically, we need to change from passive to active learning. Now, you might say, I got a great education. In fact, I'm a success because of my education. And no doubt you are. But I think your success, not because of the system of education, but maybe because or in spite of the system of education. Let's be honest. Schools are designed for compliant students, those who can draw between the lines. P perhaps, perhaps you have a non-compliant child. How's that, how's that gone for them? <laughs> perhaps you are a non-compliant child, <laughs> or you were one, and School doesn't bring back memories of great success and happiness. Doesn't our society need people who can evaluate, who can analyze, who can create, collaborate, and ideate? So, so how do we do it? How do we move from passive to active learning? What do we do? In 2007, I was teaching at a rural school in the mountains of Colorado. And after 19 years of teaching in the traditional way, I became increasingly aware that my students weren't learning as much as I'd hoped. And so myself and the teacher next door, we had a crazy idea. We started to record our lessons using software and making these things we called micro videos. And we had our students watch those before class, and then class time became transformed into a place of active learning. And then something crazy happened. Some other teachers got wind of the model, and they started to copy it. And then the model spread. The model has become known as flipped learning. Now, flipped learning is a framework which enables educators, get this, reach every student. The flipped approach inverts the traditional model by introducing course concepts before class usually in the form of these micro videos or some kind of a text reading assignment. And then the class time is magically transformed into an active place of learning. 
Now, let's, let's define what that means, active place of learning. That's where the students are going to be doing projects, simulations, games, discussions, debates, experiments, or maybe something as simple as practice. I imagine that some of you are going to go home tonight and you're going to have to help your kids on their homework. Perhaps it's been 20 years since you took high school algebra. Wouldn't it be better if the practice happened at school where the real algebra expert exists? Your kid's teacher? As one teacher said it, basically, the flip classroom is the class you always wish you had where the teacher didn't talk at you but instead came alongside you. When I first flipped my class, my students' test scores rose one standard deviation. And, and more than that, we were able to do 50% more experiments. I was a science teacher. But, but something much more dramatic happened than the test scores and the experiments. Because of the extra time that I had with my students, I got to know them better. In fact, they got to know each other better. And I was able to talk to every student in every class every day such that I can say that I could reach every student in every class every day. And as the popularity of this model has grown, that led me to start an organization whose sole purpose is to help teachers move from passive to active learning through flip learning. In a recent study of about 15,000 US chemistry professors, they estimate now that 25% of them are flipping their class. But the the more interesting part of this study is the connection they made between flipped learning and active learning. They're, they're saying that those who are flipping their class are doing active learning. And in contrast, those who aren't flipping their class, the 75%, they were 16 times more likely to rely on lecture. Wow. As of right now, there's about 500 research studies on flipped learning, and it's painting a very interesting picture. It's saying, for example, that it works at every level, from elementary through graduate education. It's working in every subject, from math and science and history and uh, engineering and medicine. It's teachers who teach in this model are more satisfied. Students are more satisfied. Flip learning has spread throughout the globe. It's happening in Harvard and Stanford and MIT. Do you realize that Harvard Medical School has flipped? That's right, Harvard Medical School has flipped. I recently got back from a trip to Misiones, Argentina, where they are, get this, they are flipping the entire province. Represents 1,000 schools. And they're doing this in a place with significant economic challenges. We're calling it the miracle of Misiones. And you'll find flipped classrooms all over the world, but what you're going to more likely find, because it was a grassroots movement started by teachers, is that you're going to find one or two teachers almost at every school, at least here in the United States, who doesn't have a few teachers who've experimented with flipped learning. So, so why is this working? Why is flipped learning spreading and why is it working? To understand that, we want to look at the work of a, a educational research by the name of Benjamin Bloom, who in 1958 created something called Bloom's Taxonomy. And it has to do with levels of cognition or thinking. It's typically pictured as this pyramid. And you read it from the bottom up, remembering, understanding, applying. You see, as you go up, it gets more difficult. And in a traditional class, let's just say my traditional class that I taught for 19 years, since I was spending most of my time teaching, you know, standing up and doing the teaching thing, I spent most of my class time at the bottom of Bloom's taxonomy, and I spent little time at the more difficult cognitive tasks. But of course, with flip learning, we flip the taxonomy on its head, and we have more class time to do more difficult cognitive tasks. And as we've thought about this more deeply, we think the ideal shape, if you will, for a classroom teacher is to have a diamond shape, where the bulk of class time happens, if you will, in the middle. Flip learning asks one really simple question. What's the best use of a teacher's class time? It turns out there's no right answer except the higher orders of thinking. But there's a wrong answer, and that's direct instruction or lecture which is, by the way, what I'm doing to you right now. I'm talking about a lecture about not lecturing. I don't know if you catch the irony there. Yeah. <laughs> so that's odd, right? But 
let's paint the picture more. So let's, what does it look like to do applying, analyzing, evaluating? Think of a biology teacher. She's teaching a lesson on photosynthesis. So she has the students watch a short video about photosynthesis before the kids come to class, and they come to class, and they do an experiment with light and plants. Or an auto mechanics class where they watch a video on how to change alternators or read the manual, and they come to class, and they fix alternators. Or let's put this in the corporate sector. You realize this works in corporate world, too. Let's say that your, your company is going through a new customer service protocol. So your employer gives you some time to do some pre-learning. That's important that they give you some time to do that. And then when you come to the face-to-face -face training, you role play, say, how to deal with difficult customers. Dr. Robert Talbert, who's one of the leading researchers in this field, has said this. He said, flipped learning is the single most significant educational movement in the last 20 years. By now you might be wondering, <laughs> why isn't this happening in my kid's school or my kid's class? I think it has to do with the traditional mindsets that permeate the educational system. And I'm just going to talk about my own. I, I wish I could tell you that when I first helped pioneer this model in 2007, that it was easy for me to go from passive to active learning. But that's not true. There was something about teaching where I felt that I had to be teaching, <laughs> doing the teaching thing, standing up like I am right now. And I hate to admit this, but part of me liked being the center of attention, the guy with all the answers. But when I flipped my class, and I not only saw the results of my students increasing, but as it really brought me back to the reason I became a teacher in the first place, connecting with them, reaching every student, I knew I could never go back. Which leads us to a very disturbing question. Why are we being so casual about what any other profession would label malpractice? If a doctor discovers a better treatment for an illness and another doctor says, yeah, I, I want to use the old, outdated, worse treatment, that's not okay. So why do we put up with that in schools when we know that a one-size-fits-all lecture delivered to passive student model doesn't work? We're committing educational malpractice. We're committing educational malpractice. And if you feel the same way, isn't it time for us to start talking to our schools about flip learning? But let's make this more personal. How many of you are parents? Are you okay if your son or your daughter gets a treatment that we know doesn't work? I'm a dad. I'm not okay with that. And yet, <laughs> that's what I did for 19 years. I guess to be fair, I taught how I was taught. In fact, I taught how I was taught to teach. So those of you who are teachers here, I'm not blaming teachers. I'm a teacher. It's, it's, it's not a teacher problem. We have a problem with our system. But it is going to take courage on the part of teachers and schools to make the change. Because... Because we know active learning is better than passive. I mean, it's a simple question. Would you want passive or active learning? It's, it's a no-brainer. We know this works. I know this works personally because I saw it with my own students. I saw it with my honor students. I was, able, I was able to push them to new heights. But more importantly, I saw it with my, my struggling students, many of them who had learning disabilities, who got the one thing that was the most valuable thing they could get from me my time and attention. I saw it recently on a trip to Australia where I got a chance to visit a flipped class, a sixth grade math class. And I got a chance to just talk to some of the students. I was turned into one young lady and she says, I really like the flipped classroom. I said, all right, tell me more. And then she said something really intriguing. She said, I'm not holding my friends back anymore. Do you hear her heart? 
she struggled in the class, and she was feeling like she was holding her friends back. Later, she said, I now get to ask my teachers more questions. I got the feeling that before, she, she couldn't raise her hand, or if she did, she was afraid of being ridiculed. We know this works. That girl had been reached. You know also why we know this works? We know this works because, well, this is what a flipped classroom looks like in Iceland. And this is one in Istanbul and in Taiwan and in Morocco, Singapore, Iran, at Harvard Medical School. I got a chance to visit this classroom. It was amazing. New Zealand, Hong Kong, the United Kingdom, Spain, Australia, China, Misiones, Argentina, and right around the corner here in Gurney, Illinois. Isn't it time that we change how we teach? Isn't it time that we stop committing educational malpractice? Isn't it time that we move from passive to active learning? I dream of a day when every student, and I mean every student, is in an active place of learning, and, and more than just active, it's also a place where they connect. We know good teachings about relationships and connecting with kids, and that's happening in these flipped classrooms. And in fact, I dream of a day when we don't have to call it flipped learning, we just call it learning. <laughs> Isn't it time that we change how we teach? from passive to active learning so that we can indeed reach every student in every class every day. Thank you very much.